I'd like to introduce our speaker, Mike Riddle. I've known him for over 20 years. Uh, that in itself is something. Uh, he, started, he got his bachelor's degree in math, taught high school math, got his uh, ba uh, master's in education, and spent 20 years teaching the engineers at Microsoft how they really should do their thing. So he also served in the Marines. Any response there? All right. And he was a captain in a missile unit down in Yuma and uh, has been teaching creation science evangelism for a very long period of time. And we are blessed to have him with us here today. He has his own ministry, uh, the Creation Training Initiative, after having been with the Institute for Creation Research and then full-time with Answers in Genesis. And he's been speaking nationally and internationally, so we're very blessed. Michael, come on up. Thank you, Joseph. What he basically said is, I'm very old. <laughs> Thank you. In case you're wondering, I, I had a wonderful time in class yesterday, but you'll have to ask the people who attended their opinion. <laughs> uh, I, I did fail, kind of, because no one did any push-ups. <laughs> but anyway, isn't it a wonderful time to be a Bible-believing Christian? Not because it's getting easier, but because it's getting harder. I'd like to start by reading a quote here. In this quote, um, some of you may recognize the occasion, maybe even the person. And I quote, You are about to embark upon a great crusade. We have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, and battle-hardened. He will fight savagely. I have full confidence in your courage, devotion to duty, and skill in battle. We will accept nothing less than victory. That was a quote, or an excerpt from a quote from Dwight D. Eisenhower the morning before our troops went on D-Day, 1944. Before that day ended, there would be over 8,000 American casualties. The cost was high, but they achieved their mission, victory. Those soldiers that day left us a legacy, a legacy of freedom. All of you sitting here this morning are the beneficiary of what those men did that day. Because of what they did that day, we're able to sit here this morning and honor our Creator and Savior, Jesus Christ. The cost was high. The Bible's also clear that the Christian life will not be a playground. It is a battlefield. And every one of you sitting here this morning is in this war. You got in this war the day you were born, and you switched sides the day you were born again. We've been given a mission by our Creator. And that is take the message of salvation into enemy territory. So my talk this morning is called Principles of Warfare, Bringing Down Strongholds. I'd like to start with another quote, Jim Wilson, U.S. Naval Academy. Principles of War, Handbook for Strategic Evangelism. He makes this statement. In the study of warfare, great men have concluded there are some overriding principles that if followed will always tend toward success in battle, and if neglected or ignored will tend toward defeat or even destruction. And that is true both of physical war and spiritual warfare. I'd like to go through six principles of warfare that we need to be doing today as Christians. Number one is we better know who the enemy is. If we don't know who the enemy is, we are doomed to lose. Let me describe our enemy a little bit. In Ephesians 6.12, it says, We will not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Our battle is a spiritual battle, and we need to understand that. It is not a physical war. We are all in this spiritual war. 
And here's our enemy. He is a liar. He is a deceiver, and he has deceived many today. He's a slanderer. He will accuse you. He's a murderer. He is strong and crafty, and ladies and gentlemen, he is stronger than you are. He is in the business of recruiting. And he's very successful these days at recruiting. 1 Peter 5.8. Be a sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. He is recruiting many and many in this country today. Principle number two is we need to understand our mission. Without that mission, folks, we are doomed to lose. And the mission is right in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to follow all that I have, notice that, all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. There are three participles in here, those things that end in I-N-G. The first one is go. The implication is going, that you will continue to do this throughout your lifetime. Baptizing and teaching. But there's one imperative verb here. Make disciples. That is what Jesus Christ told us to do. That requires an awful lot of work to make disciples. So principles of warfare. We need to know who the enemy is. It is a spiritual battle. We need to know our mission. It's given to us by Jesus Christ. Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Principle number three, we need to learn to follow orders, folks. We have been given warnings. We've been given instructions and orders. We need to know how to follow these orders. Jesus gave us an example. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. Jesus gave us the example. What God has told us to do, we should be doing, not playing games. How many of you have seen signs like this? Don't drink this. You're going to get a tremendous bellyache. How many see this one as a challenge? <laughs> You've just given yourself away. <laughs> then don't touch this or you're going to get an amazing surprise. Or for those of you who like to go to Florida, don't let your dogs loose. <laughs> and finally, my favorite, Little Hope Baptist Church. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on how you read that one. Those are all signs to warn us. But God gave us some warnings, he gave us instructions, and he gave us orders in his book. And we need to make sure we follow them. Not just some of them, but all of them. Examine everything, we're told. Hold firmly to that which is good, abstain from every form of evil. We're told to examine everything. Examine everything against what? The truth. His word. Not my opinion, not what scientists have to say, but his word. To examine everything. The desire of every Christian to know the truth and be able to proclaim it with authority. Folks, if you don't know it well enough, you can't proclaim it, can you? So we need to study. We should distinguish between truth and false doctrine. How do you tell the truth, the difference between truth and false doctrine? You must know the truth first. If you don't know the truth, you can be easily deceived. And that is happening all over our country and our churches today. They're being deceived. And let no one deceive you. This is so important. I'd like to give you an example of this. Don't let anybody deceive you. If I were to call you names, you would know that, wouldn't you? Matter of fact, I'm going to do that. May I do that, Pastor? Call everybody here a name. Okay, thank you. If you don't like it, it's his fault. <clears throat> <We're> not... Okay. <clears throat> when I look at all of you, every one of you, know what you are? You're a bunch of knock-kneed creatures. What are you going to do about that? I called you a knock-kneed creature. Well, Mike, we're in church right now. But as soon as you step outside that door, we're going to get you. Well, actually, being knock-kneed is a good thing. It means your upper leg bones slant in about nine degrees this way. It's called your carrying angle. By having that nine-degree carrying, carrying angle, every time you take a step, it puts your foot right underneath your body so you can walk a straight line. Now, if you were not knock kneed, your leg bones went straight up and down. In order to keep your balance, every time you took a step, you'd have to walk like this. Now, who walks like that? Apes and football players. <clears throat> I made that statement once, and there were two professional football players in the group. They stood up, 
They were bigger than me, and I did what I had to do. I repented. <laughs> but if I was to call you names, you'd know that. If I was to stand here this morning and ridicule, you would know that. But if I was to stand here this morning and deceive you, you may not know that unless you know the truth. The Bible over and over again tells us, do not be deceived. Let no one deceive you. We must be good students of the truth. Not just hearers, but doers. Instructions, commands. Here's a command. 1 Peter 3.15. We are told to be sanctified, set apart by his word. But we're also being told, this is going to be a hard one, folks. This is a command. To have a ready answer. Always. Not sometimes. But always, folks. This is from our creator God, our Savior. We are commanded to have a ready answer always for the hope that's within us. And then it says, I'll paraphrase, do this with gentleness and respect. We're there to be a witness. Not beam over the head. But the headlock does help sometimes. Always. That means we need to do this our full life. Learn how to have answers. Who did Cain marry? How can the first three days be a days with us the son? Why does, how can God be good when he allows bad things to happen? It seems to be a contradiction. Can you answer those challenges? We're told to. Are we doing it? This is what God has told us to do. He's told us in Jude chapter 1, verse 3, contend for the faith. That word contend is a very strong word. It's where we get our word agonize. We're told to agonize over our faith, not take this thing lightly. These are biblical commands. And 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5, we are told to bring down all strongholds and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Anything that goes against God's word, we're told to bring that down. Wow. Sounds like you're going to be studying 25 hours a day now, doesn't it? No, we take it a piece at a time. Take it a piece at a time. Ephesians 6. Three times in this chapter, it says, stand firm. Don't waver. Stand firm. And then in 2 Timothy 2.15, tells us how to do this. Study to show yourself approved, rightfully handling or dividing the word of God. That is our standard. Everything will be held up against God's word. If it does not agree with God's word, it is not correct, folks. question is, do you really trust God's word? We find out in many churches that is not true. They'd rather trust man's wisdom or their own wisdom over God's word. And it starts in the very first chapter of the Bible, Genesis 1. Too many do not have trust in God's word. Colossians 2.8, instructions about false teachers. See to it that no one is no, there is no one who takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception. Sounds like some of the things happening today, doesn't it? such as evolutionism, critical race theory, social justice. See to it that there is no one who takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception in accordance with human tradition, in accordance with the elementary principles of the world, rather than in accordance with Christ. Do not be deceived. So we have know the enemy, know the mission, follow orders. He's given us orders. We're to have ready answers always. Study to show ourselves approved. And number four, we must know the enemy's tactics. What his strategies are. He twists the word of God. He did it right in the Garden of Eden, didn't he? He disguises himself. He imitates. He counterfeits. He steals, murders, and destroys. He accuses. He hinders. He slanders. He afflicts and oppresses people. Those are some of his tactics and strategies. One of his greatest weapons was what I call the three Ds, deception, doubt, and denial. See, under physical persecution in the history of the church has grown. Where it stumbles is when people distort God's word and deceive other people. Deception, doubt, and denial. Satan deceived Eve. Oh, God, that's not what God really meant. Let me tell you what he said. You know where I hear that today? Christian universities. God didn't really mean six days. Let me tell you what he meant. I've got the degrees. Right out of Garden of Eden, folks. That's what's happening. 
right in our own Christian universities, they're deceiving our youth. Then Eve harbored doubts about what God had to say. Then they denied the very word of God. And because of that, all of God's creation is now under the curse. Deception, doubt, and denial. Let me give you some examples here. Scientists have proven the earth is old. I've got the degrees. I have a lot of scientists that agree with me. I go to church. The earth has got to be four and a half billion years old. They're deceiving our youth. Are we doing anything about it? Creation is a secondary doctrine. Well, I like to ask the question, what's the difference between a primary and secondary doctrine? Most of the time, they can't answer, so I have to give them an answer. A primary doctrine is any doctrine that affects the gospel or any other major doctrine. And folks, the creation account, Genesis chapter 1, the first three chapters, are the foundation for why Jesus Christ had to go to the cross. It is a gospel issue. It also deals with the character of God. The first three chapters are so important, folks, that without those three, we don't have much of a Bible. Because after the first three chapters, the whole rest of the Bible is God's plan, redemption and restoration. Or the first three chapters are why we have the rest of the Bible. We need to understand the importance of God's word. Every bit of it is God-breathed. Since dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago, how do we fit them in the Bible? This is the tool they're using against our children. Are we combating that in the church? This is what you call a loaded question. Who said since they died out 65 million years ago? I know some people right here can answer that question, but I'm not going to call on you. I'm going to do something that is not my spiritual gift called mercy. That is not my spiritual gift, but I'm going to try it here. I'm not going to call on you. The age of the earth does not matter. Yes, it does, folks. It is a gospel issue, character of God. It determines whether Jesus told a lie or not. But see, if they have the degrees, they can sound so convincing. Don't let anybody deceive you. Study God's word. What does it say? The Equality Act, H.R. 5, promotes rights, equality for all citizens. No, it doesn't, folks. It creates equity, equal outcomes. No matter how hard you work, you're going to get the same as somebody who does no work. They're going to get the same as you. Everybody gets equal. If you live in a big house, no longer. Because somebody doesn't have a big house, you've got to share it with them. That's what this law says, folks. It sounds nice, but it's not. Social justice, critical race theory. Folks, critical race theory is one of the, it is the most racist philosophy we've ever had in this country. If you promote these if you promote through the social justice movement or critical race theory, folks, you are now saying you're teaching and endorsing another gospel. And Paul says something. If you're teaching another gospel, promoting another gospel, you're an anathema, folks. You're cursed. These promote a different gospel. Do not be deceived by what they call them. Atheist Indoctrination Project, 2007. It seems atheists have developed a comprehensive strategy with, to win the minds of the next generation. The strategy can be described simply. Let the religious people breed them, and we will educate them to despise their parents' beliefs. In fact, it's to a large degree orchestrated by teachers and professors to promote anti-religious agenda. We're doing the breeding, they're doing the educating. Who's winning? They are. We've got to do better. Folks, this whole idea of reset, deconstruct and reconstruct, did not start yesterday. It really got started in 1905. In other words, we've had over a century to prepare for this. We didn't do it. 1905, 100 people met in an upper room in lower Manhattan called the Intercollegiate Socialist Society. Can I give you their purpose? Number one, change America into a socialist nation based on Karl Marx. Is that not happening today? Folks, we've had over 100 years to combat this. You know what their second agenda was? Rid America of a Christian worldview. See, they knew they could not have the socialist nation unless they got rid of the Christian worldview. What's under attack today in this country? Our form of government and Christianity. It's been going on for over 100 years. Strategy, to infiltrate their ideas into the education system by organizing chapters in as many colleges and universities as possible. Wonderful strategy. They had an excellent strategy. Take over 
universities that train teachers. By 1917, just 12 years, they were on 61 campuses in 12 graduate schools teaching Marxism, socialism. They were moving very fast. Why did they move so fast? How could they do it? There was very little to no opposition from the church. Whoever controls the schools rules the world. Hitler knew that and Stalin knew that. Whoever controls the education controls the next generation, the belief, the government, and religion. How many like picture format? Okay. Some people use this side of the brain. Some people use this side of the brain. Some people just don't use it. <clears throat> Let me show you what they did, picture format. Number one, they got humanism. What in the world's humanism? Humanism is basically atheism. Man is the measure of all things. There are no supernatural forces out there, no gods. They infiltrated that ideology into the teacher colleges. Then those teachers went into the other secular universities and began teaching. And then they went into the public schools and started teaching at the elementary grades, socialism. Now, unfortunately, some of those teachers came out of those colleges and went to the Christian universities, now indoctrinated into believing socialism. And all sorts of ideas that the Bible is not God's word. It contains errors in it, higher criticism. Then they got into the seminaries, which are dangerous places now. And they filtered their way into the churches. And I'll show you some of the results of this. Leonard Ravenhill, in his book, America's Too Young to Die, 1979 he wrote this. American could die, but it would have to be by suicide. He knew no country is going to conquer us physically. We will conquer ourselves. Let me show you a road map, what we've gone through. 1947, our road to suicide. The Supreme Court declared separation between church and state. That's not in any of our documents, is it? There's no separation of church and state as they teach it. 1962, the Supreme Court removed prayer from the public schools. 1963, the Supreme Court banned the reading of the Bible in public schools. 1973, the Supreme Court allowed abortion on demand. 1976, the American Civil Liberties Union prohibits Christmas pageants in the public schools. See how they're gradually taking over one piece at a time? 1980, the ACL removed the Ten Commandments from the schools. In 2007, California eliminates the use of which mom, mom and dad from the schools because they're offensive. Now you see what's happening. Pronouns today. You've got to use the proper pronoun. 2008, California made an attempt to go against homeschooling. Fortunately, they failed that one, but it's coming, folks. Homeschooling is going to come at a great attack. 1980 to the present, the media and public schools use censorship as a dominant method for controlling society. Evolution only teaching. Socialism is the best form of government. 2010, the takeover of the government by the government American education system called Common Core. 2015, the U.S. Supreme Court legalized same-sex marriage nationwide. 2020, America's invaded. Some of our major cities come under attack by anarchists, and we sit there and watch it happen. 2021, critical race theory is the new form of suppression and racism. It's now mandated in our public schools. 2021, Christian values are being replaced with social justice values. Rather than following the Bible, now it's what man teaches. 2022, California is attempting to pass Assembly Bill 2223, which is infanticide. Folks, they're trying to pass this law, and they've almost passed it. Up to almost nine months after birth, you can kill your child. That's after birth. And the churches are letting it happen. And the latest, California implements AB 329, known as the California Healthy Youth Act. Mandatory sex education, K through 12. Strongly promotes LGBTQ agenda. And educators must affirm different sexual orientations or they lose their job. Mandatory sex education starting in kindergarten. You wouldn't even want to look at the books they're using. They're so explicit. What are we doing about this? 
who's to blame then? If we're not doing anything, then who's to blame? Can I show you some alarming statistics? Over 60% of our youth are leaving the church, and that number's growing. Something's not right. Over 80% of our Christian youth have doubts about the Bible. Why is that? I'm talking about youth go to Sunday school. 80% of them have doubts about what's in the Bible. Less than 50%, far less than 50% of evangelical pastors has, have a biblical worldview today. Just recent. What do young adults aged 18 to 35 believe about the existence of God? Four different research groups challenge this topic. Here's what they come up with. Stat one. Two-thirds, 61% of Americans, aged 18 to 35, doubt the existence of God in this country. Stat two, Americans' doubt in God doubled in one generation. We allowed this to happen. Percentage of people with a biblical worldview is declining with each new generation. There's our youth right there. The baby boomers, that's my generation, right after World War II, 10%. It's now down to 4%. You know what this means? What we're doing is not working. We need to change. It's simply not working. Business as usual needs to change, folks. Why are they leaving? Let me give you just some of the topics here. Number one, Christianity is shallow and too exclusive. Yes, we are exclusive. Don't deny that. There's only one way, and that's Jesus Christ. We are exclusive. But shallow? There's no excuse for that. There's too much lightweight teaching in our churches today. Too much compromise going on. Not enough good, sound education. Church appears to be anti-science. There's no reason for that, folks, because God created all the scientific principles. He owns it all. We own it all. So why are we losing that one? We don't teach our youth. Teaching about evolution in college. Our youth are not prepared for this. Lack of specific or scientific evidence for a creator, folks. It's everywhere. Everywhere you look, there's evidence of a creator God. We just don't use it. College is a hostile environment towards Christianity. Yes, it is. We need to prepare our youth for that. And the teaching of moral relativism, social justice, and critical race theory. Our youth don't know how to handle these things. Most adults don't know how to handle the critical race theory. They are well trained in how to answer your questions. Very well trained. Are we well trained in what we know? And we found out in a lot of this. A lot of our youth and youth groups are not saved. They really can't give the gospel. They especially can't defend it. Vody Bauckham, in his book, Indoctrination. The correlation is clear. If we continue to send our, Christian, our children to Caesar for their education, we need to stop being surprised when they come home as Romans. We are sending our children to an organization called the Government Schools that is anti-God, anti-Gospel, and we're expecting them to survive in that environment? And we talk about in the ancient times when they sacrificed their children? Aren't we doing the same thing spiritually? So know the enemy. Know the mission. Follow orders and know the enemy's tactics and strategies. Number five, we better start training the troops. For one or two hours a week, we come to church, and we say, we believe, we believe. Then we send them off to the public schools, and what do they get for over 20 hours a week? The Bible is foolishness. It's fairy tales. You can't believe that. Who's winning? Not the church. I have a question here. Would it make any difference in the church's influence of the world if all the Sunday school programs and youth programs were terminated? And the answer I get is no. What does that tell us? If we stopped all the youth groups and all our Sunday school classes, would it make any difference? No, it really wouldn't, what we found out. Why? The church has become a relic when trying to influence society. We've brought society into the church, but no longer do we have much of an impact on the world. In the early 1900s, we had a large impact. The church made a big difference, but no longer. We have become a relic in this respect. So what is needed? We have a mission, Matthew 28, 19, and 20. We have all the tools to fulfill this mission. What is needed is a plan that can be translated into action on the part of Christian educators, parents, pastors, and youth leaders. Folks, we need a plan. 
because what we're doing is not working. And we need to know how to implement this plan. Every major business does this. It's the church that does not. I don't know how many of you been in business. I've been in business. And we always sit down and have our plan. We have our mission. And we know how we're going to implement it. It's absolutely essential the church learns how to design and implement this education program or we're going to continue to lose our youth. So who's responsible for the training? Well, we've got government schools, we've got church, we've got Christian schools. Who's responsible for training our youth? It's right there, folks. Not the church. The church assists in this. Christian schools assist in this. But the primary teacher in a child's life is the parent. But I have a question. Have we trained our parents to do this? No, we haven't. I'm going to show you what quipping is not. You do not become a great runner by going to seminars about running and reading books about running, do you? You've got to do what? You've got action. You've got to practice it over and over again. How about for a musician? Can you become a great musician by reading stories about it? Attending seminars? No. You've got to practice and practice. We happen to know one concert pianist in there. Ten hours a day practice. Be a great runner. You're out there practicing five hours a day. It is work. It takes dedication, not just reading books and attending seminars. How do you become a great soldier? Reading books? No. We send our troops to the battlefield to practice this over and over, tactics over and over. Spend weeks and weeks in, in the field practicing it. maneuvers. You just don't read books and learn how to be a great soldier. And then all of this is also spiritual warfare. You can read all the books you want. You can attend a lot of seminars, but that's not going to equip you. You've got to practice this, verbalize it, and know how to do it. It takes work, folks. The question is, are we really willing to do this? God's given us all the tools and the methods how to do it. It's in his word. It's this instruction manual. So what is needed? We need to have some education standards. The number one thing I've found out in all the research I've done about Sunday schools, the number one thing to pump life into your Sunday school program is train your teachers. Invest in your teachers. Training requirements. First of all, we need to make sure they have a biblical worldview. Just saying, oh, I use the Bible. I, I know the Bible. No, that's not good enough, folks. We have to have set standards. Oh, I have a biblical worldview. I read the world through the biblical worldview. Guys, that is not good enough, folks. That, that's not a definition. We have to have clear standards. Do you believe in the Trinity? Do you believe there's only one way? Do you believe that God created everything in six days? You need to have set standards for a biblical worldview called biblical doctrines. Do you believe these biblical doctrines? And once you set that standard, no one should teach you in your church unless they believe them all. We actually have a list of 19 of them that sets the Bible apart from every other religion and philosophy in the universe. Called a definition of a biblical worldview. 19 biblical doctrines that we're using as a standard for anybody to teach. Become skilled in communication teaching methods. There's something new. You know what the near unpardonable sin is when you're teaching? Being dull, boring, and monotonous. God's word is exciting, folks. It's exciting. And we need to bring it to life. This can be learned. Not, not everybody's a natural teacher, but we can learn some of this. Good communication skills. Professionalism. A teacher is a leader. We need to practice on what is leadership. Are they really a leader in there? Do they have command presence? And they're engaging. How to get everybody involved in your class, not just the one or two you like to pick on all the time. Can you get everybody involved? This is teaching, engaging, leadership, command presence. Not just anybody available. We need to have a standard of success. Here's your first test. And most, some of you know what happens if you fail my test. We've got plenty of aisles for doing push-ups here. How should a teacher measure their success? A, B, C, or D, or maybe something else? I'll give you 10 seconds, and I want an answer. 
How about students look forward to attending the class? Well, that's nice, but that's not your answer. Most students get A's and B's. That's nice, but that's not the answer. The teacher's well prepared before each session. That's also good, but not the answer. How about D? Every student's given the opportunity to contribute. That's nice, but not the answer. How do you measure your success as a teacher? It's not necessarily by what you have done, folks. It's what can your students do with the information. If they can't do anything with it, then you have not taught. All you've done is given 12 weeks of information. Your success should be measured by what can your attendees or your students do with the information. If they can't do anything, you failed. We need to start looking at education from a biblical worldview point. What does the Bible teach about education? Stop mimicking the world and let's use what God has given us. Okay, what is needed? Sunday school. We need to know what the purpose of Sunday school is. Too often, it's learner-focused, not learner-focused, but teacher-focused. We need to switch that around. We're looking for somebody who knows the information. Well, that's good. We need to know the information. But can that teacher be learner-focused? In other words, what can your students do? That's what the measure is. Yes, you know the information, but do your students do? Do they know it? If they don't, then what do you do those 12 weeks? We need to get serious about education. What's a win in Sunday school? How do you define a win? When I get most time, well, two-thirds of our church comes to Sunday school. Folks, what you're saying is numbers are a win. I don't, know, I don't think the Bible teaches that necessarily. What a win is, is your students can actually do things. There's their doers of the word now. You've taught them to be, in other words, make disciples. That's a win, folks. Making disciples doesn't mean you sit there and listen. Can you actually do this? Develop a meaningful curriculum. Educate for success. And we have a whole program. We only educate for success in our ministry. We do not tolerate failure. We do a lot of coaching. See, in Christianity, we want everyone to succeed, and we're, as an instructor, we're going to t do what it takes to get us there. How about youth? What is needed there? We're going to step on toes here. A productive youth training program. Uh, this is what we normally see. I call them hipsters. The number one thing a youth pastor has to be able to do with their youth, number one thing, is to train those youth to know the gospel, believe the gospel, be able to share the gospel, and be able to defend the gospel. If your youth can't do that, then what's being taught in there? Oh, we're building relationships. Well, that's a fine thing, folks, but that's not the most important. Do they know the gospel? Can they share the gospel? Do they even believe the gospel? And can they defend it? That's the number one thing they have to do, because what is our mission? Take the message to the enemy battlefield. Take it to the enemy territory there. Can they do that? Can they witness to their peers? Can they defend what they believe? That's what they need to be taught. I call this the big nine. Number one, know the gospel and the meaning of salvation. They really know what it means to be saved. A lot of them don't. Know how to think and live biblically. Do they really have a biblical worldview? We need to be training them that. Know how to respond to biblical challenges because they're going to get them in schools. They're going to get them in Christian schools too. In other words, are they being deceived? Are they discerning? Have they been taught that? Can they practice it? Know how to think critically. Analyze statements and challenges. In other words, you don't have to be a great scientist, but you know how to ask the right questions. And we learned some questions yesterday, such as, has it ever been observed? Are you making any assumptions? How do you know it's true? What do you mean by this? Learn how to ask questions. Know how to refute evolutionism. They're getting indoctrinated starting in kindergarten with that. Are they discerning enough? Know what we call presuppositional apologetics. Do they know how to use the Bible as their main tool? You know, your wisdom is not the main tool you have. The power in Romans 1.16 tells us the power for salvation is where? Not in your looks, and it's not in your wisdom. The power into some salvation is in the gospel. Do they know how to use that in a conversation? Know how to respond to relativism. That's true for you, but it's not true for me. Who are you to judge other people? Doesn't the Bible say we're not to judge? 
That's the most biggest verse taken out of context in the Bible. Know how to recognize respond to biblical compromise. Um, the days of creation, the word day can have a lot of different meanings. Therefore, Genesis doesn't really talk about literal six days. You know how to respond to that. And finally, know how to respond to social justice and critical race theory when it comes up in the classroom. These are the things we need to be teaching them. So, know the enemy. Know the mission. Follow orders. Be on the alert. Know the enemy's tactics and strategies. Train the troops. And number six, let's go on the offense, folks. We need to be on, on the offensive side here. Let's pursue. A state of war has existed since the fall of Satan, hasn't it? It's time to acknowledge that we're in this war. We're under attack. Don't wait for tomorrow. Today is the time we need to start getting prepared. I'm going to give you an example of taking the offensive position here. Prove to me God exists. Are you on the defensive right now? Yes, you are. You're being told to prove God exists. Prove to me exists. What's your best evidence out there God exists? What we need to learn to do is turn that around. I like to be on the offense. How many like to be on the offense? How many like to win? Yes, I do. But you know where we are most of the time? On the defense, trying to give answers which we don't have. Let's turn this around. Let me show you how to do this. You know what our best evidence for the existence of God is? It's called the necessity of a creator. That's our best evidence. Let me show you how to do this. Without a creator God, nothing could exist. Therefore, God must exist. That's my answer. Now, watch what I'm going to do. They challenged me. Now I'm going to turn this around. I gave them my answer. Without a creator God, nothing could exist. Therefore, God must exist. Now, Mr. or Mrs. Nonbeliever, could you tell me, using only observable and repeatable science, where the matter came from to make this universe? Can they do that? Absolutely not. No one can do that. They come up with all kinds of excuses and claims. But I'm asking for what kind of science? Observable. They can't do it. Ultimately, they're now in a position they have to believe by faith, don't they? We've just taken their foundation out from underneath them. So they challenged us. We gave an answer. Now, they, let's see if they have an answer. And they do not. And all through this whole evolution idea, we can do things like that. All through critical race theory, we can answer questions like that. Turn this around and see if they have answers for what they're believing. Quit being on the defense all the time. This takes practice, not just hearing, but it takes practice to do. So discussions, Christians, we should prepare to win. I want to show you topics we should never, ever lose. The six-day creation. We shouldn't lose that one. The Bible's pretty clear on this. God meant six days. He wrote it down for us. How many times did he write this down for us? He created everything in six days. How many times did he say that? Three. I say, you all knew that. The existence of God, sovereignty of God. We should have that one down. We shouldn't lose that. Everyone should have an answer. Where it proved to me God exists. The age of the earth. You know no scientists on this planet can prove the earth is billions of years old. It can't be done. It's beyond the limits of science. So why are we falling for it? We have an overwhelming amount of science, but we don't need that. God's word tells us it's not very old. Dinosaurs. We should never lose that. We've got so much evidence. You know what our best evidence for dinosaurs is? God created them on day six along with man. Learn to trust God's word. We don't need to be a generation that needs signs and wonders. Trust God's word. But you know, he gave us a lot of evidence. Now, I know some people in here could tell me right off the top of their head the scientific evidence that dinosaurs haven't been dead for maybe a maximum of a few thousand years. We're finding soft dinosaur tissue, red blood cells, DNA, carbon-14, proteins. All those confirm these dinosaurs have not been dead that long. But the best is what? God created them on day six. How about the deity of Jesus? Oh, he was just a prophet, wasn't he? Good man? Can you really talk about that? This is a big one, folks. The deity of Jesus Christ. Can we do that? So that might take two Sunday school classes, maybe three Sunday school classes to get that one down. But once you got it, you're ready to go. 
Can God be good and allow evil to exist? Sounds like a contradiction, doesn't it? Can you answer that question? The false record, that's not a hard one at all. We, win that. we should win that one every single time. How about the origin of us? Well, some of us. And how about the reliability of the Bible? Why? Do you really believe the Bible's true? Why is it true? Can you really answer that to somebody? And how about the sanctity of human life? Why are we losing that one? Those are discussions we should be prepared to be able to talk coherently about with somebody else. This is called evangelism, folks. These are the topics people come up with in evangelism. They're going to try and trip you up. Why should I believe what you're saying? How do you fit dinosaurs in there? Was Jesus, who, who was he? Just a good man. Can you do that? But here's our situation. We're finally getting down to the close because I'm getting hungry. Here's our situation. We're surrounded, we're outnumbered, we're outfinanced, and we're being outeducated. And even worse, there's compromise and surrender within the church ranks. This is not a time to sit back and say, woe is me. This is an opportunity. When you look at this, we now have the advantage. Because there's two things we know about our enemy. We know where they are because they're surrounding us. And we can attack them in any direction. That's the way we're trained in the Marine Corps, folks. When you're surrounded, you now have the advantage. We can go out there and witness. There's probably 90% of the people in this community on their way to hell. What are you going to do about it? We need leaders who are going to be bold. That's what we need. Well-trained teachers. Tony Perkins, summing it up. Final briefing. The bottom line, George Barner insists, is we can't keep doing what we've been doing, so we've got to change. Our plan, if we want a different outcome, and for the sake of this generation, the sooner, the better. What we're doing is not working. Are we willing to change, or we just want to continue to be comfortable? Moving forward, we have training classes. We're just the start of it. We're a small ministry. Going to seminars is good. That's the first thing you need to do. Get to seminars, understand the issue. But then you need to get trained. We had a couple of, we had about 20 victims yesterday. I'd look at it a different way. We have also an advanced apologetics training course that answers questions. How can we call God good and he allows evil to exist? Why does God send people to hell? Answering those kind of questions. We have a whole one for training people to be teachers. We have a one-day version of it. We do a lecture. We have a three-day version where we do a workshop and let you practice and train. We coach you. Communication skills, teaching skills. We go all through that. We have once a year, we go down to Dallas at Institute for Creation Research to do a Christian Educators Conference, three and a half days down there. And we want to take a next step. These are things, those are things we're currently doing. But... If we're going to talk about parents being the number one responsible teacher in a child's life, let's get them trained. We're proposing to develop a three-day parent training course, take it around the country. We're not going to charge much, but we're going to rely on donors. We need a lot of donors to do this. If we're going to be serious about saying the parent's the number one teacher in a child's life, are you willing to do something about it? It's going to cost. It's going to cost people's time. It's going to cost money. But we already got the infrastructure in place to start doing this. We just need the people to help us. Then we've got what's something called, in, we've got the writing down. We, got the, we haven't implemented this yet, called a Master Apologist Program. We believe this program will produce apologists that are better than any advanced degree or as good as any advanced degree you get in university. Because we're going to get you ready for the battlefield. We've got this down on paper, how to do this. We've got two going through the pilot right now. But this cost also. Are we serious about this? A master apologist program, one-tenth of the cost of going to a university. But it'll get you ready to be a teacher, a speaker, and be able to defend the faith, and actually go out there in your churches and train others. That's what those will do. We have some, I don't know if we put these envelopes out. <clears throat> we have some envelopes, or if you want to help us, 
uh, become part of the team. We do need people to, to help us with this. So for more information, that's how you can get a hold of this. Now I'm going to finish with a scripture here. I just want to finish with this. This comes out of the book of John, chapter 16, verse 33. We've gone through all of this. Here's what he has to say, some comforting words. A lot of doom and gloom in there. I'd like to leave with something very good. Verse 33, John chapter 16. These things I have spoken to you. Boy, he's given us a lot, hasn't he? Jesus is speaking here. These things I have spoken to you, so that in me you may have peace. All this going around the world today, we can still have peace as Christians, can't we? Focus on what? Him. Don't ignore the things down here. But we can live in peace and not be torn apart by everything going on. In the world, you have tribulation. But take courage. I have overcome the world. We can have comfort, folks. This is a hard message. But we can have comfort, and we have a big job to do. Let's get started. Thank you, and God bless you.